Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Good? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Lewis House. I feel like Brian and I have been talking about this for years, and it's uh, finally happened. It's an exciting place. I've enjoyed a rich day of conversations already, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to... We, we are, by the way, we're going to make a chunk of time for Q&A after tonight's talk, so please come with your comments and criticisms and questions. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say um, what interests me tonight. Um, uh, in some ways, I want us to think through together uh, sort of what drives us to live out certain forms of life and ways of life. And I want us to come up with a sort of a, 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 an appropriately nuanced, complex account of how we live out our lives. But I was thinking, too, if it helps you, I would say that what, what motivated all my research on this theme in many ways was trying to understand the nature of the church's assimilation to culture. That's actually also what really, really interests me. So it's personally, how do I get sort of disordered loves? But it's also, how do we sort of uh, uh, become, profess one thing and yet seem to become so assimilated to the cultural defaults of the world in which we find ourselves? And the way I want to do this is I want to think with you about the tension between two claims that I'm going to try to argue for or at least explain. The first principle is this. You are what you love. We're going to explore this. We're, we want, I want us to think through why what really defines you and drives you and animates and orients you is what you love, what you long for, what you desire. So you are what you love. However, at the same time, I want us to think through this. You might not love what you think. Can you feel the tension between those two things? You are what you love, but you might not love what you think. And in between those two things is everything I want to think about with you tonight. Now, the way I want to sort of dive into this is I want to try to create... Uh, something of a visual parable for you, but I'm going to do it in words, so I guess it's not technically visual. It comes, I, I want to use a, um, an analogy, a metaphor, a parable that comes from a film. It's a film by the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. He's such a big hit today. Uh, and the film is called Stalker. Now, you don't have to have seen this film. I'm sure that is 99.4% of us have never even seen or heard of this movie. It's okay. I'm going to set it up for you. It's a very, very straightforward and simple plot. Stalker, this film by Andrei Tarkovsky, takes place in picture a kind of bombed out post-apocalyptic wasteland. If you ever saw The Road, the movie The Road by Cormac McCarthy's, Picture that kind of world, right? Post-apocalyptic, barren land. And in this world, there are three key characters. Writer, professor, and a character called the stalker, which is, I feel like there's something a little lost in translation here because it's not as creepy as it sounds. He's really the guide, okay? So in this bombed out post-apocalyptic wasteland, writer and professor come to Stalker, the guide, because they have learned that he can lead them to an enchanted place within this world that is simply called the zone. And the reason why they want to get to this enchanted space called the zone is because within the zone, they can get to this inner sanctum, this holy of holies that is simply called the room, all right? Not super descriptive titles from Andrei Tarkovsky, but why do they want to get to the room? Because in the room, you get exactly what you want. 
Okay, so the pull, and a lot of the movie is actually following this arduous trek as they make their way through this bombed out wasteland in order to get to the zone. And when they get to the zone, it feels like another world. And when they get to the room, the whole point of getting to the room is you will get exactly what you want. Which is why then it is so puzzling that when they are on the very threshold of the room, all of a sudden, writer and professor decide they're not sure whether they want to go in. What's going on here? Why do they get cold feet? I want to read you a description of this scene by a writer named Jeff Dyer. There's a great little book about this obscure movie. There's an obscure little book about this obscure little movie. The obscure little book is called Zona, and it is fantastic. Here's his depiction of the scene. This is all you need. Picture this in your mind's eye. They are in a big, abandoned, dark, derelict, damp room with what looks like the remains of an enormous chemistry set floating in the puddle in the middle as if the zone resulted from some ill-conceived experiment that went horribly wrong. Off to the right, through a large hole in the wall, is a source of light that they all look towards. And for a long while, no one speaks. The air is full of the chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep of bird song. It's the opposite of those places where the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Here, the birds are whistling and chirping and singing like mad. And Stalker tells writer and professor, tells us, that we are now on the very threshold of the room. This is the most important moment of your life, he says. Your innermost wish will be made true right here. And so, effectively, Stalker says... Who wants to go first? Professor and writer will not step in. They hesitate. Why? Because it dawns on them. What if I don't want what I think? Right? I'm on the threshold. When I step into this room, I will get exactly what I want. But what if I don't want what I think? Well, observes Dyer, that's for the room to decide. The room reveals all. What you get in the room is not what you think you wish for, but what you most deeply wish for. And so can you feel this kind of disturbing epiphany that is creeping up on writer and professor? What if they don't want what they think. What if, by the way, I notice I have this habit. I put wants here and thinking here. We could talk about why that's the case, but I'm trying to get at a little bit of, and it's, it's, it's slightly ham-fisted, but the idea is our wants, our loves, our longings are rooted in this effective center and core of who we are. The Bible's word for that is the heart the heart. Interestingly, that New Testament term cardia for heart, although I'm, now I'm nervous because Jonathan Pennington is in the room and he's going to correct me, but my understanding as an amateur Bible reader and philo- professional philosopher is cardia in some ways, uh, um, you know, we kind of romanticize the language of heart and it could be almost like gut. Something is in your gut, right? So wants, thoughts, mind, we can complicate that in our conversation. But what, the, what writer and professor are working through is what if they don't want what they think, or let's put it this way, what if even the desires that they are conscious of and have chosen, what if in fact those are not their innermost, deepest longings and wishes? What if in some sense their deepest wants and longings and wishes have been sort of humming under their conscious awareness and they didn't even realize it? What if in effect they are not who they think they are? Can you, can you feel that tension? Can you, can, can you feel the nervousness about stepping into this room? 
Now, I, I think many of us can identify. And, and if I ask you, and I'm, I'm going to assume there are not a few Christians in this room tonight. And so if I ask those of you who are Christians, if I say, you know, tell me what you really want. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. If I ask you to tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Um, well, on the one hand, you know the right answer to that question. Okay, fair enough. But on the other hand, also, I would say this. If I ask you to tell me what you really want, what you most deeply long for, what you ultimately love, you know the right answer and you know what you ought to say, but also, and your, your, your conviction can be absolutely true and genuine. I'm not, I'm not being cynical or skeptical about you telling me what you really, really want. I believe you that this is what you think you want. It can be a deep expression of your intellectual convi conviction. My question is, how confident are you to step in this room? Do you know what you really, really want? Are you confident that what you think you love aligns with your innermost longings? This, says Jeff Dyer, is the lesson of the zone. Sometimes a person doesn't want to do what they think they want to do. Can you identify? So how, this is where we are. We're in this tension between you are what you love, but you might not love what you think. And the question I want us to think through this evening is, how does that misalignment or disconnection become possible? How, how could it happen that I don't know what I love? How could it be that I don't love what I think? Well, the human heart... <laughs> is an inscrutable thing. It is a, a mysterious, conflicted core of who we are. It's this interior depth that eludes us, and in fact, the prophet Jeremiah says, sometimes deceives us. In fact, St. Augustine, who's kind of my uh, uh, homie, uh, St. <laughs> Augustine in his confessions, you know, when he's reflecting on his interior life and he looks at the heart within, at one point he looks at himself and he says, he declares it terra incognito. It's, a, it's, it's foreign territory. I'm an enigma to myself, Augustine confesses. I don't know who I am. This is why I think it is crucial that we recover an appreciation for the spiritual significance of habit. In other words, here's the pitch. I do not think we'll be able to understand or make sense of how or why this misalignment, this gap, this disconnect happens between what we think we love and what we really love. I don't think we will really ever adequately understand the complexity and dynamics of that if we don't have an adequate account of the significance of habit in the spiritual life. So I want us to think through the spiritual importance of the power of habit in order to take stock of our spiritual lives. Now, here's where we're just going to put something like philosophical caps on for about 10 minutes, okay? In a long-standing ancient Christian tradition, love is understood as a habit. Love is a habit. Why? Because love is a virtue. Virtues are what we call good habits. Can you guess what we call bad habits then? Vices. Okay, so what's going on when we talk this way? When we say that something is a habit, uh, one of the things I think we have to do is put aside a bit of our colloquial use of those terms in contemporary culture. Do you think it's fair to say that most of us, when we think of habits, we think of like some routine that you go through? Do you know what I mean? Like you might say, um, 
uh, I always have a habit of putting on my left sock first or something like that, right? Or you think of, you might think of habits as this sort of external repertoire of movements that we go through. So you picture uh, the, you know, ridiculous batter who takes 15 minutes before every swing because they have to go through this whole song and dance, which is why they invented a clock for baseball, right? And so they've got this whole routine. He's like, this is his, his habit when he's in the batter's box. Actually, I want you to set aside that colloquial contemporary conception of habit because in this ancient tradition, a habit is an internal disposition of character. A habit is a sort of internal, acquired disposition of character, which means this is kind of something that gets woven into the fabric of who you are so that now you are the kind of person for whom doing this comes naturally. Or sometimes we use the phrase and say, this becomes second nature for you. Have you ever used that phrase before? Oh, that's second nature for her. What do we mean when we say that? Oh, that's second nature. It means she's the kind of person who couldn't not do that, right? It's, it's who she is. Okay, so this is the way we are trying to think about our loves. Our loves are habits dispositions of character that get woven into us that they are we're going to talk about how they are learned they are acquired and they get sort of woven into the fabric of our being our our character such that now our actions bubble up from our habits rather than as we tend to assume dictated by the principles of deliberation that we go through in our heads. So, is everybody with me? Does this make sense? In other words, so much of what we do is bubbling up from ways of being that have become sort of automated in us rather than being the outcomes of conscious, deliberate choice that you make in any day. And what's significant is that if our loves are these kinds of habits, these dispositions of character, What that means is your loves and your wants and your desires become a kind of default orientation to the world that you manifest in some ways without thinking about it. That's another reason we say that something is second nature, right? Because now it sort of comes to you without deliberation because that's who you are. This is what you do. And I wonder if this helps us to start to make sense of... Uh, that, that word from Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart, right? The seat and center of our affections and desires and longings. Above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because everything you do flows from it, right? In other words, everything you do, everything you are, the way you live out a form of life is bubbling up from what you have learned to want what you have learned to love, what you have learned to desire. So this picture now of the human person, and and I get that some of us might feel slightly uncomfortable with this because we thought we were more rational than we are, right? We we were sort of like very, very confident that no, 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 I, I like think through what I do. And of course, sometimes you do. It's just a vanishingly small amount of your behavior is governed by such conscious, deliberate choice. And an astonishing amount of the way you live out a life is actually governed by these habitual dispositions that you have acquired. So, why does Scripture talk about the heart? Because that is the seat of our loves. Oh, by the way, one free footnote. You will notice that I'm going to use a number of kinds of words synonymously. Love, longing, yearning, hunger, desire, affection. I'm going to treat all of those as fundamentally synonymous. Why? Because I think that we have been created by God as beings who love, which means we are beings who hunger. We are beings who desire. 
We are beings who yearn for the God who has made us. And so for me, because you, maybe you've heard like a good sermon, a good sermon that says, you know, love is a conscious choice of the will and you have to, I, I'm not denying those things. I'm saying, but there is also a sense in which the love that we are talking about is a kind of erotic orientation. Now, some people are like, whoa, 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 bro. Uh, um, eros, erotic, is not bad. Pornea stole it from us. Okay, this is very, very important. In fact, I think this is an Augustinian intuition that agape love is rightly ordered eros, is rightly ordered desire. In the very first paragraph of Augustine's Confessions, which is framed as a prayer, there is this famous, famous line in which, again, Augustine is praying to God. He says, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Almost everything I want to tell you tonight is baked into that sentence. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We are made to want. We are made to hunger. We are made to desire. The seat and center of that desire is our hearts. It's a, it's a love relationship. It's a longing relationship. It's a yearning relationship. And it's not just a matter of satisfying the intellectual question, what do I believe? It's a matter of settling this desiring question, what do I want? You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless. Uh, uh, um, the, the German translation for that sentence is angst. Our hearts are angsty until they rest in you. In other words, one of the ways to make sense of the anxiety of a culture is precisely when we are looking for love in all the wrong places. What do we mean by that? We're not just talking about sexual love here. We're talking about an anxious culture as a society in which we are looking to fulfill our fundamental hunger for the infinite by settling for finite things. Everybody with me? Okay. So, I should watch the clock a little bit. Our loves, our longings, are ultimately forms of habit. What that means is we're not talking about biological hardwiring. We're not talking about instinct. We're talking about acquired, learned dispositions of character. You learn to love. How do you learn to love? Well, like all of the other habits, all the other virtues, our loves are learned and acquired in two primary or fundamental ways. The first, I'm, I'll say, mention briefly and not spend a ton of time on, but the first way that we acquire these dispositions of character, these habits, these virtues, is by imitation. Imitation. Mimesis is the Greek word. So Aristotle would say, if I want to learn how to be just, Aristotle says, well, look at what the just person does and do what the just person does. Imitate the just person. This is one of the ways that you start to learn to live into the virtues. Now, all of us who are parents know this in our bones, and we also remember it turns out, unfortunately, you learn vices in the same way. Right? So, uh, um, the same dynamics of habit formation that are rightly oriented to virtue also work for the misdirected, disoriented habit formation that characterizes vice. So, yes, you keep thinking, I'm going to model justice and beauty and goodness for my children, and then what you keep seeing back at you are all of your vices. <laughs> because imitation is powerful. Is imitation a biblical idea? Absolutely. 
Think of when Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Whenever you hear imitation language in the New Testament, you are on the terrain of virtue formation and character formation. Okay. A lot more could be said about that. I'm going to set that aside. I'm interested in the second way that we acquire these virtues, these habits of love, and it's by immersion in practices, going through the routines. Immersion in practices inscribe these habits in us. So learning to love takes practices. Our wants are caught more than they are taught. Our loves acquire direction and orientation because over time we are immersed in practices and rituals and routines that affectively and really, by the way, bodily and viscerally train our desires. The, the way to the heart is through the body, okay? And so think of, think of the human heart like a compass, okay? Imagine the human heart is a compass. And as Augustine says, it is designed, it is built to find its true north in the God who made it, right? In the Christ, in Christ who models, and, and not just models, in Christ who incarnates the creator. So the heart is like, uh, is a compass, but every compass needs to be calibrated, The rhythms and rituals and routines that I'm calling practices are the calibration technologies of the human heart. It's how we learn to love. And I want to call, the word I want to uh, I, I suggest to name these kinds of heart-shaping, love-indexing practices is liturgies liturgies, with a small L, if that helps. Because uh, uh, I, I realize some, some people have like a really, really negative reaction to the word liturgy. We really have to get over that, okay? Um, here's why. Here's why. Think of, I, I want to call these practices liturgies precisely so we appreciate that they have religious significance, why do they have religious significance? Because any practice that shapes your love is shaping what is ultimate about you. Practices that train and calibrate or miscalibrate your heart are going for the very seat and core that God has made for himself. And so if there are rhythms, rituals, and routines, cultural practices that are calibrating or miscalibrating our heart, they are actually dealing with the most ultimate and fundamental aspect of who we are, the, you could say the most religious and spiritually significant aspect of who we are, which is why I think we should see them as liturgies. And the point is, to see cultural practices functioning as liturgies is to realize that these are not just things that you do, they are doing something to you. So let me, let me pause for a sec to make sure that we appreciate what's, what's happening here. It's not only that your habits of wanting and longing themselves can be operating sort of under the hood of your conscious awareness. It's not just that your habits are sort of humming along on, on a, 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 um, a second nature. What's really at stake here is even the process by which your habits are formed could be happening unconsciously. You see what I mean? In other words, we might not be aware that the things we've been doing have been doing something to us. And in fact, at the most fundamental level, we might not be aware of the extent to which the rhythms, routines, and rituals that we've given ourselves over to have actually been trying to grab the very core of our being and identity and make us into people who love this rather than this 
who love this rather than God. And if that's going on, I wonder, can you feel how we're starting to make sense of why you might not want to step into the room? You might have spent a lifetime thinking about what you should believe and what you should know and what you think. But if you've never been attuned or attentive to what you've been learning to love, you could get to the threshold of that room and be able to ace the theological exam and yet step in there and your heart has been apprenticed to a rival kingdom. Does that make sense? Can you see how that could happen? So consider the implications of this. If you think of these love-shaping, heart-orienting practices as liturgies, what it means is if you haven't noticed that those practices were doing something to you, it might be that you've actually been learning to worship other gods without knowing it. That's because these cultural liturgies, we're not just talking about one-off events that you unwittingly do. We're talking about formative rituals and routines and practice that do something to you that have been unconsciously but effectively tuning your heart to sing the songs of Babylon rather than Zion, so to speak, to, to quote the psalmist. And some of those cultural practices will have actually won our affections, even though we've nailed the catechism. Does that make sense? These are what I want to talk about in terms of cultural liturgies. And let, let me see if I can unpack a few examples uh, to try to concretize this. I'm a philosopher, so I love abstraction. I could do abstraction. I'm going to try to make this a little bit more concrete. And can I also say this, because I really still want you to like me? This only works if we all get a little uncomfortable. Okay, you know what I'm saying? This analysis of the depth of the way cultural liturgies can hoodwink us only works if we all feel the pinch a little. Okay, let me start. First example of a cult what I'm calling a cultural liturgy is, um, so when my, my kids are old and married now, but when, when uh, my oldest was a teenager, and he, like so many kids back in the day, wanted me to take him, drop him off to go see his friends at the mall, what he would do is he would say, hey, dad, will you take me to the temple? Ho, ho, ho. And you know how kids do that mocking thing where they're like, you know, you're familiar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dad, will you take us to the temple? And uh, despite the fact that I was being mocked, it was a parenting win. Here's why. He remembered a conversation we had in which I tried to impress upon him that Woodland Mall is not a neutral site. Woodland Mall is a religious institution. Now, what makes Woodland Mall a religious institution? Well, it's not beliefs. It's not the theology of the mall. It's not like you walk into the mall and you know there's the directory and then on the back side it says, here's our 16 fundamental truths. Do you know I mean, here's, here's what the mall believes. This is what we want you to think about. The last thing the mall wants you to do is think, right? I mean, there's just no, there's no interest in engaging your reflective capacities at all. So in what way could the mall be construed as a religious institution? Well, I said a religious institution. I didn't say a theological institution. It is a liturgical institution. And in some ways, something even more fundamental is at stake. Why? How does this work? Let's zoom out for a second. I would say that for every single one of us here, living in late modern America, probably one of the most potent rival gospels, rival deities, is the gospel of consumerism the gospel of consumerism. Now, what do we mean by this? Very simply, I would say the gospel of consumerism proclaims stuff will make you happy. Stuff will make you happy. 
I say proclaim, which actually is already overstating it, because here's the thing. The gospel of consumerism has no apologetics program whatsoever. Why? Because it's a bad idea. It is just an indefense, as, a, as an idea, as an argument, stuff will make you happy. It's a terrible starting point to try to prove. It's, it's a terrible conclusion to try to prove. We're all sitting here, it's like, that's cr clearly crazy. Does that mean there are no consumerists? So, how do we get suckered by consumerism? Well, it doesn't try to convince your intellect. It recruits your affections. It's the, the, the way this rival version of the good life works, the way this rival instantiation of a kingdom works is not by making you believe X, Y, and Z. It's by painting a picture of a life that you want to live into because everybody in that world is happy. Now, I said... Consumerism does not have an apologetics program. It does have a fantastic evangelism program. It's called marketing. Okay? How does... Uh, uh, if you're a marketer, come talk to me afterwards. We can work it out. I, I, I'm act, this is actually a compliment to marketers. Here's how I would put it. Marketing knows that you are not a brain on a stick. Marketing knows that you are not defined by what you think and know and believe. Marketing knows that your life is governed by what you want. And they know that the heart traffics in stories. They know that the heart learns to live towards a magnetic vision of the good life that has been held out and painted in vivid colors and sounds and songs. And it's precisely because, mar listen, marketers better understand the nature of human persons than the American church does. Marketers are better Augustinians than Christians because they understand that we are these affective creatures whose centers are seated in our affections and desires and longings. And so... And then it comes with, there's all kinds of, of, obviously the mall is not what it was when my kids were teenagers, right? It, although it has kind of morphed into, you know, the bougie lifestyle center where everybody still wants to go and there's a sweet green and all these kind of things. It's still there. It's still there. What we need to also think through is just the way the picture of the good life that is promulgated by consumerism is still rampant in shaping our imaginations, whether it's like every third Instagram thing you see is an ad, right, for beautiful things. How many times do you get suckered by an Instagram ad? It's like, what's scary is it knows exactly what you want, <laughs> right? What is the algorithm? The algorithm is a science of your desires that has tapped into, and what I'm saying is, as Christians, we might have spent all this time on discipleship, on making sure that we know the Bible and theology, but we completely ceded the formation of our affections to these cultural liturgies so that we've actually been hoodwinked and co-opted and assimilated by all of the other dominant stories. No wonder Christians don't look any different, right? We have our little holy clubs, but at the end of the day, we are so functionally naturalized by these cultural liturgies that we are immersed in. How does that work? It's something that you do that's doing something to you. Um, let, me try, let me try your patience and charity with a couple of examples. Let's talk about the stadium as a religious site. Now, and, and, and uh, I, I, except your stadium, of course. Your stadium is an exception. <laughs> Everybody else's stadium. Now, here's, here's what interests me about it. I, I don't really want to do an analysis of um, the way that, you know, stadiums can be temples of devotion to certain tribal deities, 
I get, you're, like I could see how it would foster tribalism. That doesn't interest me so much. I'm actually interested in a feature of our stadiums that is shared by all of them across all sectors, professional and amateur, college and pro, and it's the way in which the stadium in American culture is a temple of nationalism. You still like me? If it helps, I chose to become an American citizen. I am an immigrant who took the pledge. Actually, I had to say things to become an American that most of you have never had to say. So I'm not a bad guy, not a pinko commie. I'm an American citizen. I am Canadian, so that's maybe a slight shade of, but. Here's, here's I just want us to put these, let, let's put our cultural liturgical lenses on and look at what's in front of us with new eyes. And I want you to think about the way the drama and pageantry and imagery and rituals of a stadium look. Most powerful version is always Thursday football on Thanksgiving Day, right? Loaded with military presence, loaded with military aircraft. It, it's so funny that we just never ask ourselves what play has to do with war. But they're complete. If, if I go to the opera, there are no helicopters. <laughs> right? It, and this is true. What's interesting is it trickles all the way down to Friday Night Lights at your local high school. Right? It's there all the way up. Why? Because the stadium becomes a place to reinforce and rehearse a particular mythology about, quote-unquote, who we are as Americans. And that story is rooted in an anthem that is a bit bloody and <laughs> uh, bellicose, you could say. And then we have all of this imagery and pageantry of power and war that is reinforced there. And you can see how it's almost like the pledge is like the creed and the flag is like the cross and the anthem is like a hymn and you put your hand over the heart like a kind of national genuflection. I'm, I'm telling you, if you put on this ritual lens and see it with new eyes, if you're the Martian who flies in and says, where are the religious sites in this country? The Martian is going to the football game. And if you don't think this is religious, Uh, ask Colin Kaepernick. You don't think this is religious? Try not playing along. Try not participating in the liturgy. Colin Kaepernick was a heretic. Was a heretic. I just want to, again, I'm okay if we're a little uncomfortable because I just want us to appreciate the depth of what we're talking about here. These are the way cultural liturgies work. We could talk about Social media now, think of it again, put on these liturgical lenses, look at it through these, th this, this way. So, um, let me, for the sake of time, let's turn to the sort of constructive moment. Okay, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? How, now I, I want you to see that the key question here is, how can we have counterformation to the deformation that we might experience in cultural liturgies. In other words, how can we recalibrate our hearts to desire God and what God wants to see for the world? Overcoming the deformation of cultural liturgies will always require more than knowledge, right? So not even reading, you are what you love, will do it. It's not a bad start, I just wanna say. But it, what I mean is, you can't, this isn't a matter of like figuring it out. Knowledge will, now I do think knowledge is important because now we become aware of something and we devote ourselves with new intentionality to new practices. So what we're doing tonight is a constructive, reflexive exercise that hopefully sends us back into our practices and routines with new eyes and hopefully new commitments to the practices that will form us. What it requires is more than knowledge. It requires rehabituation, a reformation of our loves. You can't 
think your way to holiness. You can't think your way to holiness. So what do we do? Well, the first place we start is to simply become aware of these everyday liturgies in our lives. And that we've just gotten a taste of that here. It's a little bit like the proverbial goldfish waking up and saying, what's water? Right? You realize what you're immersed in. And what I want to suggest is the first move is to take what I call a liturgical audit of your life. A liturgical audit of your life. And what I mean is, find, it's, it's a little bit like, create a space of retreat for yourself where you can kind of hit the pause button on your immersion in your everyday routines and try to step back at them from them and look at them now with these liturgical lenses and ask, what are the things I do that I've just taken for granted, that I think are just neutral benign things that I do that have been doing something to me? And you ask yourself, what are the cultural liturgies in my life and what vision of the good life is carried in them such that if I keep practicing these for a lifetime, what am I learning to love? What have they been subtly but covertly teaching me how to love? And so then when you see something like the mall or the stadium or social media through this liturgical lens, you begin to see it very differently. And you begin to appreciate what's at stake in this ubiquitous feature of our cultural landscape that maybe never garnered your attention before. You never thought there was something at stake for your spiritual life at Walmart, right? But what I'm suggesting is it's the things that are closest to us that might actually be the ones that are most formative and potentially deformative. And so we get a little worried. And I would say... That's good. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's probably not a bad place to arrive at and say, man, what have I not been taking stock of? That's where we begin, but that's not the end of the story. Because now, constructively, and this is, I, I, I won't have enough time to do this justice, but I, what I hope also happens is that we put these lenses of liturgical analysis on and we see afresh what is at stake in church. In other words, I think the same, I, I can't make this whole argument tonight, but I would love it if somebody would ask me questions. You would see that, okay, why does Christian worship have a repertoire of rhythms and rituals and routines that it does precisely because it's been designed to rehearse the story of God in Christ reconciling all things to himself such that we live into that story over and over and over again and it starts to sink into our bones and we become the kind of people who love God and love what God wants for the world. We, love of God takes practice too. And what God gives us are the gifts of the practices of the body of Christ as the incubator for rightly ordered hearts. Here, friends, I think is where we need to be reminded of the madness of the gospel and the incalculable mercy of God. You know, I say, do you want to step into this room? But in fact, perfect love casts out fear. And a huge, huge re-narration of the story for those who are Christians is that, in fact, Jesus Christ has already stepped into that room for us. And what are some of the key practices of the body of Christ that characterize the re-narration of our hearts and imaginations? Well, one of the things that Christians in all times and all places have always historically done when they gather is they confess their sins right? The body of Christ is that community that is honest about the misalignment between what I think I love and what I really love. And one, in, the, in the, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, one of the forms of uh, the prayer of confession goes simply like this, the beginning of it. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. The beauty of that practice in itself is that we keep owning up to the gap, to the misconnection, to the misalignment. And every single time, Jesus says, you are forgiven. You are in Christ. 
you are renewed by the Holy Spirit. You live in mercy. In the practices of Christian worship, God gives us the conduits, the guardrails, the, the pathway for us to be reformed in Jesus. It's one of the reasons why John Calvin described the church as a gymnasium of the Spirit. The church is the gymnasium of the Spirit where Christ trains our hearts. It's where the Spirit is recreating us to be the image bearers we were made to be, to love and worship the one that we're made for, because it's in Christ that we find our true north. Thanks very much. questions. And so a few minutes to ask some questions. If you have a question, you can just kind of stick your hand up. We've got a few of our scholars who are going to be wandering around the room. So we've got a few people stationed around. So if you have a question that you want to ask Dr. Smith, ask why he even queued you up for one saying, please ask this. So we've got a few questions. Uh, so we'll tackle. I see we've got one. Brooklyn, what you, we'll start back there. I saw a hand go up in the corner and then I'll let Dr. Smith take it from uh, okay, there. Great. Yeah, great. If, and if I don't see you, just wave or shout or Thanks for uh, on. test. Radio check. Is it up? I think so. It's working? Okay. There we go. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Just terrific. My wife cringes when I'm going to get up and ask a question, but I thought <laughs> do it anyway and embarrass her. Good. So I, I like the, uh, the analogy or the talking about our temple of the, the stadium and uh, nationalism. Could it be also uh, competition, warriorism, fighting? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of driven yeah. us through society, but, yes. but we go to the battlefield on a football field or a soccer field yeah. or a whatever field as kind of, uh, it's the same, I think, yes. but I, I get and a comment I think on that. In some ways, um, football is probably our most bellicose form of sport, right? The most, certainly the most violent and the most warlike and things like that. So you can see how there's almost like a natural resonance between a certain kind of militaristic way of being. I should say too, I mean, we could zoom out and say, I guess part of what interests me is us asking ourselves, what am I learning to love? What vision of the good life am I covertly and subtly being apprenticed towards? And in, in, in that sense, um, whenever I become the kind of person for whom dominating others is an animating impulse in my life, Augustine says the libido dominandi, the desire to dominate, is exactly the marker of the earthly city of man rather than the city of God, right? And you can, by the way, you can play that out in very, very civilized ways in business and still be somebody who desires domination, right? So it's, it's very, very subtle the way that these things can work. Um, yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, ask how this might uh, how everything that you're talking about might interact with like Romans 7 it kept coming to my mind the I do not do what I want to do um, yeah. and, but the in my innermost being I delight in the law um, and so like how does how do you reconcile like the flesh with our innermost being being maybe perfected yeah so I'm absolutely not answering this question with Jonathan Pennington in the room <laughs> who's a New Testament scholar teaches at Southern Seminary um, uh, 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 Jonathan, just plug your ears for a second. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I do think that there is some conversation in the literature and commentaries about whether in Romans 7 Paul is talking about a past life or his current experience, and I'm just going to be agnostic about that. I, I do think that that sort of the turmoil that's named there, at least on an existential level, feels very familiar to me. I don't think, um, uh, sometimes I feel like what we assume is going on in the language of inner and outer is different than what the ancients thought was going on in the language of inner and outer. And so sometimes I'm nervous about the way that we inherit this. The one thing I would say is this, 
we know for certain that flesh here is not synonymous with body, right? It's not because we have bodies that we experience this. Flesh is actually sort of the shorthand for disordered love, disordered will, disordered way of being in our bodies. And I think um, uh, the possibility of our rightly ordered love is precisely because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the the indwelling of the Spirit is the condition of possibility for the renewal and right ordering and recalibration of our heart's affection. It's just that I'm an Augustinian, so I think the fight is lifelong. Do you know what I mean? Like the the fact that we, we, we will spend all of the years in this mortal veil engaged in the necessity of rehabituation. And, and it's why for Augustine, I think Augustine is kind of a spiritual realist about these things. And I find that very liberating in a sense. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be hoping for progress in the Christian life. But I think that the progress usually feels like learning the new things that I need to work on in my life, which is really kind of lame. But I, it's, it, you know what I mean. You know what I mean? It's like you, it's a, the school of virtue is one from which we never graduate. Um, at least until the eschaton, it seems to me. Yeah. Good question. Bad answer. Hey, we've, we've got one back here. Um, I was wondering, speaking of schools, this is great. I was wondering what the implications of your vision are for the formal, formative institutions of the young, especially. So for the church, what would it look like for a youth group to take your talk seriously? For a yeah. school, what would it look like for a Christian school to take yeah. what you're talking about seriously? Yeah. So I think I, I spent a lot of time talking to Christian schools, actually, because one of the things I'll say, in, let's, let's stick with the institutional piece of this. Um, uh, one of the ways that the ancients, Aristotle, Augustine, would talk about this institutionally would be to talk about ethos, right? The sort of, and, and I'm going to do a kind of lazy contemporary rendition of the word ethos as vibe, it's like the hum and buzz of an institution. And I think the ethos of it, it which is kind of like the, the, the um, I don't know why I'm going to a womb metaphor right now, but it's, it's like what incubates the, the people who inhabit this place, this institution. And for uh, what I think we need to think about are very intentionally, what are the rhythms and rituals and routines, the liturgies of an institution that carry, a, let's say a Christian school, that perform the core elements of the gospel rather than just teaching them didactically, right? So it could be as simple as, well, not just an example would be, you know, the entire day is framed by uh, morning and afternoon, vespers kind of dynamic, right? And you have sort of framing practices of prayer. Or it could be, maybe instead of saying the pledge, you say the creed. Do you know what I mean? If you want to feel a little bit of the, the sort of counterformative tension. You, the, the one thing I, I want to believe in is that micro rituals have macro significance. So you don't have to spend an hour doing these things. It's actually the repetition of little things over and over again that kind of reinforce and make it sink down into your bones. So these, these micro practices uh, um, have a cumulative effect over time. Um, youth group, uh, I think it's chapter four of You Are What You Love. I, I would just say, uh, I think way too much youth group, youth ministry has effectively wheeled in the Trojan horse of entertainment liturgies and thought, well, it, and, and right, what happens is, by the way, not just youth group, churches on Sunday mornings have wheeled in cultural liturgies and thought, well, if we just put a little Jesus on that, um, they, they, they mistakenly assumed that these practices were neutral. But in fact, we know they're already loaded with forms of desire that make us want stuff or whatever it might be. So you might think in the name of being relevant that you sort of wheel in these other cultural liturgies because everybody likes going to Starbucks and everybody likes going to a concert and everybody likes going to the mall. So why don't we just 
do the mall and a concert and a Starbucks, and then, but we're selling Jesus. Yeah, that's the problem. You're selling Jesus, right? Jesus is one more thing on the shelf to make people happy. I think the domestication of ministry that happens with the best of intentions is part of what we need to sort of work through. Yeah. Sorry, I got a little soapboxy there. Uh, actually, I'm not sorry, but you know what I mean. Yeah, with the age of social media, what is a way to not fall into the algorithm of the platforms when you are following consumerism of marketing through Christian channels and influencers, and et cetera? Yeah. Are there Christian influencers? Yes. <laughs> We're going straight to hell. Um, <laughs> of course there is, because American Christianity has, for 150 years, just replicated Jesified forms of the cultural liturgies that we're immersed in. I mean, it's, this is, guys, 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 we got to do better. Um, uh, where to start? Um, there are Christian influencers, eh? Um, so let me, this is probably not an answer to your question, but I will say this. I'm not trying to demonize technology per se, but what might be necessary for some of us is a season of abstinence altogether from such platforms in order to recenter our loves and affections such that we could be there without being immediately sucked back in as the addicts of love that we are. Do you know what I mean? I think one of the things that characterizes late modern life is that the only way that we know how to think about freedom, St. Augustine would say, is addiction. <laughs> like we think, oh, well, you have all the freedom of choice and you can do whatever you want. And Augustine thinks mostly the way that that form of freedom plays out is you sucker yourself into being enslaved to something that you thought you chose that you thought was going to make you happy. I think that is so our problem today. Um, and uh, I, I think it's probably going to take rather drastic measures for us to have resistance. I say that with some caution because for the most part, I don't want you to walk away from here thinking that I think the recipe is to hide from the world. I don't think that for a second. In fact, I don't even think we can because we are called to be in the world and bearing witness to God and tending creation and stewarding culture and bending this world towards kingdom come. So we have a vocation and calling to be engaged in the world. What I want us to do is to go into it with clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose, uh, um, you know, with eyes wide open and to see what's at stake and... I think of, sorry, I'm a million miles from your question now, but think of the Christian life as characterized by an ongoing centrifugal and centripetal dynamic. I hope I got these right. Centrifugal takes you in. Yes. No? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So centripetal takes you in. Yeah. So here's what we do. Centripetally... We are gathered by God around word and table to be recentered and to rehearse the biblical story in order that it becomes the narrative that shapes our loves and longings and imagination. So we centripetally gather week in and week out to be recentered in God and the story of Christ. But how does that worship service end? With ascending and a benediction and a charge and a blessing which centrip sends you out to bear witness in the world and to take up actually our cultural calling to be unfolding and unfurling the possibilities that God has laid, in, laid into creation. But you have to have both of those things, and it's ongoing. You, because of uh, uh, the certain kind of dissipation and risks that come with, with sending, we have to keep coming back and being recentered, but we don't get recentered to live in some holy huddle. The whole point is to be recentered so that we can be sent again to be God's image bearers for the sake of the world. I think it's, mo it's that sort of dynamic we should think through. Yeah. Who's got mics? I, I do over here. Oh, very good. Um, you talked about small L liturgies, both yeah. good and bad. Um, what about big L liturgies, like yeah. uh, 
traditional forms of worship, their value or their necessity or devotion. Yeah. Like their traditional forms of worship or devotion yeah. and things like that. So the way uh, um, I, I'm, I try to do this carefully, um, what I will tend to talk about is what I'll just call, for lack of a better term, the repertoire of historic Christian worship. Okay? So I do think that there is a kind of a crude wisdom of the body of Christ across centuries and millennia, shared across a vast array of Christian traditions where you can still discern a shared grammar of kind of what the narrative arc of a Christian worship service looks like, okay? There'll be some differences in things, but there's, there's actually a lot of kind of core agreement about what that worship looks like. I am not an apologist for worship that is traditional, right? In other words, my argument is we should be traditional. My argument is the tradition has wisdom for us to be faithful. Do you see, there's a, I hope the semantic difference makes sense. So I'm not just a turn back the clock nostalgically, oh, remember when it was great when. What I would say is, and this is a place where Protestants and evangelicals perhaps in particular need to sort of just tune their ears back beyond revivalism of the 1700s and 1800s. Most American Protestantism is revivalist. Um, and we forgot the gifts of the tradition. Um, but if you go back to Luther, Calvin, and back, there is actually a high degree of a kind of commonality around what the repertoire of formative Christian worship looks like. And I think um, that repertoire has a lot of contemporary treasures and wisdom for us to become a peculiar people who can embody the faith going forward. I do think that there's room for innovation. I think the church is always reforming. I think we are always contextualizing. I think we're always contextualizing. But I do think that for the most part, for me, what it means to be a Christian is to be Catholic. Calm down. What I mean is um, that you receive the gift of that the Spirit has led the church across the centuries and the wisdom that has accrued across time. Uh, and every single one of you who carries a Bible already does that because there was no canon of Scripture in the first century, right? We are all indebted to post-apostolic decisions that the church made that we carry in our hands. What I'm saying is apply the same principle to the accrued wisdom of what the liturgical repertoire looks like. Yeah. Is that, am I in the ballpark of your question? you elaborate more on this saying, you have made it, made us of yourself, and yes. our hearts are restless until it rests in you? Yes. So, St. Augustine, you have made us for yourself. So, it's a prayer to God, the Creator. You, um, you God, have made us with a design, right? The human creature is, is sort of made with a design, which is, this is what's cool, humans are ecstatic creatures. What that means is we find our meaning, we find our fulfillment, we find our fullness outside of ourselves. We, we are not autonomous, independent, self-sufficient agents. That's not what it is to be human. We are made as human beings who are made for to find the ends of our loves and hungerings in the infinite God who made us. So it's... Um, most U2 songs are about this, if it helps. But you're young, you're young, so it doesn't, that's, a, that's a real Gen X energy right there. Um, what that means is, in a sense, um, a Catholic theologian named Henri de Lubac says, every human being is created with a natural desire for the supernatural. A natural desire for the supernatural. We are finite beings who are created with an infinite hunger. Therefore, the only thing that can satisfy our infinite hunger is the infinite God who made it. However, a lot of human beings, including most of us, spend a lot of our days under the illusion that we could try to satisfy that infinite hunger with finite things. 
and by the way, all kinds of us who are Christians functionally still live if that was the case, right? But what happens, can you see how you're sort of set up for failure? If you have an infinite hunger for, that can only be satisfied by an infinite being and you keep trying to satisfy it with finite things, you're just sort of doomed to disappointment. You might fool yourself for a while, but eventually it collapses. Um, when we try to satisfy an infinite hunger with finite things, that's what we call idolatry. So idolatry isn't only, and maybe not even fundamentally, belief in false gods. It is disordered loves and expectations of finite things, right? Looking for love in all the right places. How am I doing? Is this helping? Um, so you have made us, oh, oh, last piece. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. What, what will characterize a life that is spent trying to satisfy infinite hunger on finite things is profound dissatisfaction, right? Which will paper over in all kinds of narcotic ways. But what happens is that restlessness is itself a positive sign of what we are made for. Right? So in some ways, I think this is a powerful analysis of cultural, p powerful tool for cultural analysis where you can meet someone and say, it's clear to me you're looking for more. Um, and it's clear to me that you are profoundly unhappy <laughs> and dissatisfied and anxious and restless. Uh, um, that's a touch point. That's a point of contact to think about whether there's a hunger for something. Could that be satisfied somewhere else? Hey, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming and speaking for us. You're um, I will say it was very convicting, and especially because being These completely... These altars are open. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess I confess, I do use my phone a That's good amount. That's my Pentecostal background. Um, every eye closed, every head <laughs> bowed. Um, but I guess my question was, you know, it's something that is so, so much something that can mold us as well as distract us, but also it's such an important and powerful tool for yeah. connecting us with people, for learning, and I mean, honestly, just... I don't know how I would get anywhere without GPS. So, um, <laughs> but I guess, like, what is your like practical advice for having a healthy relationship with our phones? Yeah, you know what? I, I I'm not trying to punt on the question. I will say I don't know if you want to hear an old white dude in his fifties answer that question because I feel like I just have a different relationship to a phone because I lived most of my life without it. Do you know what I mean? So it's not. I, I think. I think this is a conversation you all should be having amongst younger generations to say, what would it look like for us to, th this is a, what, what's the phrase? This is a, a um, helpful servant and a terrible master, right? So, so what does it look like to set up my life in such a way that this is serving me and not me serving it? And... Um, Again, I, I just feel like I live in old fuddy-duddy world, so I don't know. It, I mean, for example, I do not have a single notification that comes across my phone unless my wife texts. I'm not an idiot, right? <laughs> so uh, my wife's texts get through, but otherwise, mute, 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 mute. Some of it is just regaining your attention. Re realize, realize this. Your attention is such a precious commodity for your spiritual life. Your attention is actually so crucial for your spiritual life. Don't give it away. Don't let Silicon Valley have it on the cheap, right? Um, think of it as a resource that you want to steward and resist. But again, I feel like, you know, the way you guys engage and get together socially or how you connect is very different than me. So I, I, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just don't think I have the right answer for you. Um, but it's a great conversation. To be, and it'd be a great conversation for Lewis House to foster, you know, like, how can we do this well? And I'm sure you already do because you guys are awesome. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is, like, what happens when the counter habits become the ends in themselves? Um, for example, when 
would you like to get coffee with me becomes I need coffee or <laughs> um, <laughs> such as like when we see this as a discipleship method or an evangelism method, but then it becomes a, a need in itself. Interesting. Um, of the, the liturgy, which has good merit and could help us grow with God, becomes the very means by which we, we associate with that liturgy or that piece of, yeah. of coffee yeah. um, with, with something that we, we need yeah, which we and, then, and then it's becoming like a substitute or a yeah. crutch or an addiction or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I think there has to be a regular stock taking. You know, I talked about the spiritual audit idea. I don't think you do that once in your life. Do you know what I mean? I think like my, my friends who are Jesuits, right, every single year they go through a rigorous retreat of examination to sort of take stock again of their loves. I think we need to kind of build this in and keep having checks. The other thing I should have said when we were talking about liturgical audits, we need to do this with one another because um, often probably the cultural liturgies that most have a hold on me are the ones that are most invisible to me. And so... Yeah, it might be, you're like, oh, yeah, you can, you know, pick on the football stadium because you don't watch football, right? Or, you, you know, you can, you can pick on all these other things that are not your life. Where are your idols, Jamie? And then if you, and this is, my wife is always very help, happy to help in this regard, but it would be like, um, well, what are the liturgies of prestige in the academy to which I am a sucker, right? What, what am I chasing in terms of my professional life that actually I'm treating as if this will really make me happy rather than giving myself over to entrust myself to the God who already loves me no matter what my performance academically might be. I think we need to give each other the gift. Of, now, you need relationships of friendship and trust to be able to do that. Like, what I'm not, don't go around and say, oh, I see the cultural liturgy in your life. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not, that's, it has to happen in a context of community where we, where we help each other recognize when something has become bent in that way. I think that that would be important. It's great. I have no idea what, what the uh, time. Uh, two, two more questions. We'll do two two more, more questions. Great. So my question comes from the section of your lecture where you defined where love comes from and what love is. Yeah. Um, so do you think that love comes from the pursuit of these liturgical practices or do you think they come from the action like in and of themselves? Because I feel like that's part of the problem that people see with uh, liturgy is that it becomes like heartless and yeah. just going through the motions. So, yeah. So if, if the question is where does love come from, Actually, I would back it up a little bit and say this. Love comes from our created nature. So in other words, to be human is to love. And you can't be human and not hunger, long for, love, and desire something ultimate. So I think that is built in as a structural feature of creaturehood. What's in question is the direction that that love takes, right? So uh, um, if, you, if you want to think, think about this theologically, the effects of the fall or sin on this picture of the human being is not that love gets turned off and you have to learn how to love. You, it's that love gets misdirected and misoriented. So... The love is there as kind of this nonstop engine and drive of longing and desire. That's part of being human. What, what, what's, at, what's in question is how it gets aimed. And I think, significantly at least, it is we learn what to love by the rhythms and routines and rituals that we give ourselves over to that are loaded with some story about what the good life is, about what ultimately we ought to love. And um, in that sense, 
we do go through the motions and it works, okay? We go through the motions and it works. Now, I think then we get a little uncomfortable about thinking about this in the counterformative habits of the body of Christ. I'll, I'll say two things about that. First of all, I'm kind of an advocate of the virtue of going through the motions. If the motions are rehearsing the biblical story of God and Christ reconciling the world to himself, then I will say this, 90% is showing up. 90% is showing up and giving yourself over to those practices. And I will say that as a parent, on the days when, you know, my teenagers are like slumped in their chairs and don't want to be there, blah, blah, but they stand up and say the creed, and they extend their hands for the benediction, and they're going through the motions, I'm like, there's always work going on there. The Spirit is always doing something in that. Now, can it become superstition? Can you just sort of, yes. And I think what happens there is we don't have what's called liturgical catechesis. What I mean is sometimes in these communities, we don't help people understand why we're doing what we're doing when we worship. And then you just do it because grandma told you to or because we're Italian or what, do you know what I mean? And then it becomes like an ethnic identity. And in that case, I agree, uh, it, it, that undercuts its, its formative and counterformative power. But I think if you can put together the package, friends, this is a really, really important sort of, uh, I forget who I was talking to at lunch today. Uh, there's a little bit of a paradigm shift about how we're thinking about worship here, okay? I would say the default paradigm, uh, particularly in contemporary evangelical worship, is what I would call expressivist. We mostly think that you show up to worship to show God how you feel about God, which is why it's really, really important that you be sincere and mean it, which is also why you need new songs all the time because they get boring and then you're worried that you're faking it. I'm talking about an entirely different paradigm where the point of worship is not for us to show up and show God something. It's for us to answer a call to worship because God is already doing something. And when I show up to worship, I am actually getting caught up in the triune life of God who is shaping something in me, whether I feel like it or not. It's not predicated on how sincere you are. Oh my gosh, that dog is gorgeous. I just saw that puppy. It's not predicated on, on entirely, because that, otherwise that's what Augustine would call Pelagianism. Do you know what I mean? Like that's just spiritual self-sufficiency. Um, what we're talking about is an entrusting to the movements of the spirit that are carried in these practices. I think, I think it just changes. I hope people experience it as liberating. And it's one of the reasons why you show up even on the days you don't feel like it, because God is already there. And you're stepping into the river where, he, where God is active, right? Yeah. Last one. Great. From the Calvin College shirt wearer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a two-part question. Uh, okay. Well, so, you're cheating. Yeah. You're supposed to be so it, this, hopefully this is short. Outside of Augustine, what are uh, one or two other philosophers, theologians that have shaped your thinking the most? And as a proud Calvin graduate, could you talk a little bit about some of the Calvin philosophy uh, department yeah, uh, sure. heroes? Yeah, great. So, um, I mean, I'm really, it might sound funny to say uh, somebody who teaches that a reformed institution is primarily shaped by Augustine and Aquinas, but that really is the case. I mean, that's uh, um, uh, because, again, we see this as part of the great Catholic tradition of how we uh, um, uh, think about such matters. Um, but I would also say Aristotle has been a very significant, uh, and you could, if you know anything about Aristotle, that will not surprise you <laughs> at all. Uh, I am very grateful to, um, I, am, I am a Christian philosopher in a generation who benefited very much from a generation before me who sort of cleared the path for those of us to be quite unapologetically Christian in our philosophizing, even in the wider academy. Nicholas Wolterstorff, Alvin Plantinga, uh, Stephen Mavro or, uh, uh, um, uh, George Mavrodis, others, this sort of uh, um, vanguard generation made it possible for us. I think maybe one thing, and this is something we talk about in the Calvin philosophy department now, because, so absolutely some have a calling to make that impact in the specialist academy. 
Interestingly, I would say the current generation of the philosophy department at Calvin, we are united around the vision of philosophy as a way of life. And I think we see our generation, one at least of our generation's callings, is to try to translate philosophy for the sake of the life of the church. And um, that's not any easier than the other. It's just a different kind of difficulty. And I think we're trying to sort of live into that calling right now. Yeah, I hope. I hope. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs>